Good evening. It's five o'clock, and with all members, all nine members of the board present, we'll call this meeting to order. And tonight, our moment of silence and pledge of allegiance will be led by Miss Owen. Please stand for a moment of silence. Face the flag. Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. With liberty and justice for all. Okay, a few a couple of announcements. Just a reminder that our July board meeting dates have been delayed to the second week of July due to the July 4th holiday. So we will have our work session on Monday, July 10th in this boardroom, and our regular session meeting will be in the City County Building Main Assembly. <laughs> at 5 p.m. on Wednesday, July the 12th. Board members, our next policy review meeting scheduled for Thursday, June 15th, is going to need to be an extended version. As you know, we have worked diligently to complete a review of the entire manual during this fiscal year, and we still have a ways to go. So we wanted to try and push on through the remaining policies. So without any objection, we will be starting at 12 noon on June 15th and work until the end of the day. Recognizing our elected officials, thank you, Chairman of Commission David Wright for being here tonight and Commissioner Evelyn Gill as well from District 1. Um, are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Ms. Roundtree seconded by Mr. Norman. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Okay, next is our superintendent's report with Superintendent Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, have brief, uh, some brief updates here that have taken place since we last met. I'll go over several administrative appointments that have been made since our last meeting. I've uh, appointed Cindy White as uh, principal of Gibbs Middle School. Cindy was previously principal at Bine Middle School. Corey Smith has been appointed uh, principal of Hardin Valley Middle School. Corey was previously at uh, Rocky Hill Elementary. Denise Blefko was appointed principal of Powell Elementary. Denise was uh, previously assistant principal at Copper Ridge. Chris Henderson was appointed principal of Farragut Intermediate School. Chris was previously principal at Halls Elementary. Desiree Jones was appointed principal of Vine Middle School. Desiree was previously assistant principal at Fulton High School. Mitch Cox, or Mitchell Cox, was appointed principal of Halls Elementary School. Mitch was previously principal at Indian Springs Elementary in Sullivan County. Brett Foster is appointed executive director of Child Nutrition Program. Uh, Brett was previously a school area supervisor for in our school nutrition program for Knox County Schools. I'd uh, like to thank our board members who attended and participated in our graduation ceremonies this year. We really appreciate uh, board members being there and participating. I know our principals and staff members uh, appreciate that as well. I would also like to thank uh, Cheryl Hickman, who is executive director of uh, elementary schools, and also uh, Danny Trent, who was super is supervisor of secondary uh, schools for attending uh, uh, actually 17 graduations uh, during, during that week. So I appreciate uh, Appreciate them being along uh, uh, with with me. Uh, this year, uh, uh, we've had uh, 3,845 students uh, graduate, walk across the stage. So uh, I think I, I got to shake about 3,842 hands. Three, uh, two or three of them got by me before I could catch them. But uh, nonetheless, a smile for each one of them, a lot of happy faces, a lot of happy parents. And our students uh, were uh, actually were awarded uh, in, in terms of monetary figures, almost $148 million worth of scholarships is what, what our students earned. So, um, and a hundred of our students actually have committed to uh, joining the military and will serve our country in the military. We've had two appointments to academies, one to the Naval Academy and one to the Air Force Academy. So uh, no, uh, so proud of all of our teachers and our administrators who uh, 
who worked with those students from um, in some cases pre-k or kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade so it's just uh, it's really um, amazing to uh, attend the graduations and and see see all the awards and all the honors that our that our students get and and in addition to uh, um, their parents thanking their parents just to thank their teachers and staff members that have worked with them for for all those uh, all those years uh, we have four Knox County school teachers who have been selected to be part of the 2017-2018 uh, Tennessee Educator Fellowship Class, which is an initiative of the State Collaborative on Reform Education, or SCORE. It's a year-long program to equip educators to advocate for their students and their profession as they continue teaching. Um, there were 50 educators from across the state were chosen, so Knox County is, uh, again, very fortunate to have four teachers who have been selected, and those teachers are uh, Amy Cox, who teaches third grade English uh, language arts at Halls Elementary School. Amy's been teaching uh, for us for 18 years. Laura Davis, who teaches social studies at West High School. Laura's been teaching for four years. Lindsay Davis, um, who teaches mathematics at Austin East High School. Lindsay's been teaching for 12 years. And Amanda Pickett teaches uh, special education at Holston Middle School. Amanda has been teaching for four years. So certainly we're proud of uh, the teachers that will be representing Knox County Schools. An update on the Tiger evaluation pilot. Uh, it's progressing on schedule. Uh, we were pretty much in a situation where it was a condensed schedule, but uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Rodney Russell and, uh, and John Ryswick and their work uh, with, uh, with the Tiger evaluation model and, and actually uh, making things happen very quickly here and in a short period of time. The seven schools that uh, have been selected to participate, that's Farragut High School, Halls Middle School, Mount Olive Elementary, Spring Hill Elementary, Powell High School, Richard Yokely School and West Valley Middle School. So we have rep good representation, I think, across our district. The uh, first design team meeting is scheduled for June 13, and the administrators of the seven schools will attend training either on uh, June 16 or July 10. And one final announcement, uh, on Thursday, July 27th at 6.30 p.m. at South Doyle High School, we'll be celebrating the graduation of another co cohort of school security officers. And if you can attend that, I will certainly encourage you uh, to do so. So, Madam Chair, members of the board, that concludes uh, my report for this evening. Thank you. Are there any questions regarding the superintendent's report? Okay. Ms. Etheridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. It seems like we have graduated quite a few security uh, personnel. So how we come, are we maintaining a certain level or we uh, have a certain number we're trying to achieve we, we it's around 102 103 and i think with this this cohort group i believe there's 20 maybe 22 in this group that'll get us to to about that number so of course every year there's some who who uh who come and who go but uh there because i know we had made an adjustment about having more at the elementary level than, than middle and high so with us continuing to increase our members of the uh, security team would we be able to at least put more in the middle school and high school that um, and again the number I think it's uh, I don't know if uh, chief is here this evening with us or not but it's uh, uh, apparently not but it's about a hundred and two or three so it's it just maintains what we had uh, I can get I'll, I'll make sure we get you the the exact okay. uh, allocations for the schools okay if we're training them and they graduate and then they're going somewhere else I just wanted to know yeah we, we do lose lose a few each year Okay. Okay. Thank you, Superintendent Thomas. We'll move into the um, agenda for the Wednesday night meeting, looking at items and contracts first. And looking under items and contracts, um, number one and number two, are, is there any discussion or questions on those two? Okay. Three and four were amendments to contracts that were previously done. Are there any questions on items three and four? Okay. Let's look at five. I kind of went through and grouped these. Let's look at five through eight. Any discussion or questions on those? 
Ms. Owen? On number seven, do we know how much of this cost is being taken from coupon book sales? Who would, who would know the answer to that, looking around the room? I, I believe uh, Darlene, Madam Chair, Darlene Miller, I think, is here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Ms. Darlene, Miller. If you, I don't know if you, if you would approach the lecturer there. I don't know if you know the answer or not, the, the question about the amount of money from coupon book sales to, uh, for item seven. For the core advantage child target. assessment. Um, I, I'm not certain the exact percentage of that, how much. I know that they um, typically in the past that has been covered with the Title I funding that we've had, but this year, I don't know that those exact numbers have come out, but the uh, Title I funding has allocations have been cut. So because of that, they were uh, taking it from some of their other avenues to fund uh, <coughs> needed things. And, and that is an assessment. The core assessment is something that the uh, Title I pre-Ks, the VPK pre-Ks, we just don't have our, we got our contract today, so it's not up for approval yet. But um, all of those are um, our core assessment that we use with our preschool children to assess the students all through the year and monitor their progress. Okay. Did you have a follow-up? It's, no. it's not a question. I, I just have a concern about using student fundraising money for, for assessments. That's, that just feels very wrong. Madam Chair, and I do agree with that, but under the circumstances, they don't have a choice because the funding's being cut now. I would be, ha I know they'd be happy if we decide to pay for it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm in agreement that if they can't, then we should figure out another way and they will have to use their money. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dethridge. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, items nine and 10 are a memorandum of agreement and a memorandum of understanding. Are there any questions? regarding item number nine or 10. Okay, items 11 through 14. Okay. Uh, I did have a question on 11, <clears throat> number 11. I'm a little bit familiar with this uh, Wilson language training. This orientation and, and uh, introductory workshop, what is included in this $21,000? Ms. Massey? Yes, the, okay. it includes the cost of materials. It includes a, the, the initial orientation workshop is up to 30 teachers for the initial introduction to Wilson. And then it's a pretty comprehensive program that also includes a trainer for our level one t teachers, which is open for 10 of the educators. And then there's an also an orientation for administrators who are going to be evaluating teachers who are utilizing Wilson in the classroom. Okay, so this isn't like just a one shot, no. one day mm -hmm. in service. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank and you. instructional materials are included as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Massey, can you, I know you said it was up to a certain amount of teachers. How are those teachers being identified and selected to participate in the training? <clears throat> so we have, um, we have a number of new teachers every year, so we target those teachers and then anybody that we pretty much offer Wilson in most of our elementary schools and many of our middle schools, and we're just building the number of teachers who offer that intervention as an option for our students with learning primarily learning disabilities, but other disabilities as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, items uh, 15 through 18. Yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Rupler. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted a quick word on item 15 and items like that. Uh, this item's on your agenda uh, for Wednesday in raw form, so to speak. Uh, what we're trying to do with these agreements, uh, these, are, these are prom agreements for, for, the, uh, for the venues. And obviously each high school is going to have a prom each year. 
Uh, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to uh, make these more standardized with uh, the managers of the venues uh, so that a, um, once they're standardized, a principal could select from a list of, of approved venues that, 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 that the board's already approved uh, and, then, and then go from there. So, so that's the goal at this point. Um, you know, if this, if this particular contract goes through and the reason it's still on your agenda is because they were trying to secure the date for 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so I can, I can mark this, this contract in the, in the changes that I've recommended, uh, for your Wednesday meeting, uh, which, which center, center around insurance and indemnification and those types of issues. Uh, but, but that's why it's still on your agenda. But what, what we hope to do, hopefully by next uh, month's agenda, is have more standardized contracts for, for any prom venue. That's the next slide, Ms. Fugate. Thank you. Following up on that, uh, Mr. Dupler, so um, we're going to come up with some standardized <coughs> contracts, and you mentioned a standardized you know, venues that people could choose from. Is that going to have to go through procurement to see who is willing to do, do um, events for us, or how are we going to approve those? And I, mean, I think it's a great idea because it is a real heart palpitation for people to know that venues get booked a year in advance, and you've got to have your prom and your winter formal and all that stuff lined up. And I think it's a great idea. I'm just wondering about how we go through the mechanics of who's on the list, who's not on the list, and, and that kind of thing. Are we, are we polling principals to find out what venues they typically use? If I may, yeah. thank you. Uh, we're, we're working on venues that the principals have, have indicated that they would like to use. Okay. Uh, so that's how we're looking at that. I'm also working with procurement, uh, and we've already had conversations along the lines of what you're talking about. Uh, these standard contracts will work if the money is coming directly from students and parents, uh, there may be more of an issue, more process involved if it's being run through the school accounts. Okay. So, but, I, but we are working on that. I just asked for that so that people who are listening to this on TV and know that we normally do a procurement pro process, I just wonder how we were going to handle that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on those items? Thank you, uh, Mr. Duper. 20 and tw through 22. Mr. Norman. You probably want to include 19, don't you? Okay, you want 19? Yeah. 22, okay. I've got a question about 19. Okay. I don't know, is Mr. Grubb here? I guess that's for Mr. Grubb. Mr. Grubb. Hey, Rick, thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Um, just uh, tell, me, tell, tell me a little bit about GPS as regards our, I guess, our past, first of all. Did we have this contract before? Uh, uh, no, sir, Mr. Norman, not with this particular vendor. We've had some sort of GPS for more than 10 years now. Um, our, our current contract uh, expires at the end of this school year, which was last week. We, uh, we've been researching for more than a year for the right solution that we feel like is the best for the money for Knox County. Uh, this particular uh, product includes some of the uh, uh, necessary items for us to meet changes in state law. This past legislative session, several what, what things. What is some of that? Could you give me a little bit of those For changes? instance, uh, uh, we now, even though we don't own the vehicles, we are now charged with being responsible for maintaining maintenance records of the buses that belong to the contractors. We are responsible for maintaining the inspection records of the vehicles that belong to the contractors. We are responsible for maintaining all training records of the drivers employed by contractors. We are uh, uh, now placing a placard on the back of each bus with a phone number for for a helpline from the general public. And uh, the, uh, the training that's now going to be required for a school bus driver, which has been performed solely by the contractor, we anticipate that when the state board completes their curriculum, 
beginning in January that we are going to have to provide some of that training and it looks like with road testing component we could be looking somewhere around 40 hours to train a bus driver and so um, all of those things have been added what this particular zonar tool will do it automates pre and post tri trip inspections there's a small device about this big that the driver actually what they will do the the, the big pieces of this zone are was they will when they enter the bus they have at the end of it it will read the proximity card which is the driver's badge and we print their picture on it they click that then it says what bus am i on and they put the bus number in because we have 425 buses and 340 routes so there's no it's not static what bus is on what route so this will give us a means to push to the back end when we're looking for bus 100 it is 100 based on the driver and 100 in this device it also places nine locations on the vehicle a small disc that is uh, attached to the vehicle and the driver has to be within five inches of this disc and click the button and it and it automatically records that they looked under the wheel well they looked in the fuel entry cell they looked under the hood so what we're adding here is a very a critical piece of safety and at the same time we are capturing on the behalf of the contractors and keeping records for them on our pre and post trip inspections which now are done by the driver on paper form collected periodically from the contractor and stored at this point we don't have we have no knowledge of what any of them say this will allow us to make certain that the bus has been checked both before and after the route and uh, benefit the contractors to, to take away a, a significant amount of paperwork for them so that's so zonar captures xy's that's more than i need it, it can, okay appreciate it okay. I, I have a tendency to tell you how to build a clock when you ask me what time it is <laughs> okay thank you mr mcmillan and miss horn i don't know who was next so with your permission miss horn i'll go to mr mcmillan and then come back to you mr mcmillan um i just had a question there maybe it's more of a comment about uh, i believe it's 21 uh, the 23,000 for the purchase of uh, uh, mulch, removal of old mulch, and, mm -hmm. and they just seem like a, a rather large number to me when I, I was looking at the memo that was attached, the breakdown, of course, there are 300 tons of number 57 rock there at a cost of about $4,600. And then uh, I think there's 800 square yards of, of I guess of, of actual mulch. I guess it all it all adds up. It just seemed like a rather large number, and for 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 this mulch, uh, 300 300 tons of rock. What you know? What are we What are we really doing? That seems like a large number. Okay, Mr. Dillingham's getting ready. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. McMillan, under all of our playgrounds, we put about a four-inch layer of, of rock as an underdrain. And what that does is it, it helps the water travel through rather than ponding, raising up, and washing the mulch away. So that's a requirement on all of our playgrounds that we have maintained for several years now. Uh, when you talk about mulch for a playground, this is not landscaping mulch, it's engineered wood fibers. So it's a special type of mulch uh, or covering that is put in. So it's it's typically called mulch, but it's really not. Um, so right. it's, and it is quite expensive. Okay. I'm, 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 and I was aware that we did at least some, and maybe not all, but, but some of what you're talking about as far as letting the, the water flow through, but still 300 tons of rock seem like a, 
a large figure. My, my, I, I don't know that much about that sort of stuff. I'm not in the landscaping business or anything. I've never had that experience. And I'm not sure. I mean, they have some fairly large playgrounds down there, I'm, I know, so okay. it, it was, doesn't surprise I, I, me. I realized it was one of the large, I just wondered what, what kind of an area that it covers and everything. I, I do not know right off the top of my head what the square footage is on those playgrounds. Uh, typically, at uh, uh, the elementary level schools, they'll have a playground for K through two and one for three through five. and they get fairly large, and especially with the, the the fall zones that you have to have for the equipment that's in there, extending out quite a distance from the the, the piece. Uh, okay, right. twenty three thousand, I would say, is probably about average of what schools okay. spend on playground cover. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Grubb, my I think you already answered my question was which was the. GPS equipment that would be for all the buses. Is that correct? We uh, we are estimating 425 buses. We have three we plan 340 routes next year. The number of buses the contractors use to serve Knox County is not static. They bring in new buses on a constant basis, and so uh, our goal is to have a working camera system, a 800 megahertz radio and a GPS solution on every vehicle that's transporting students. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Dugget. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dillingham, in, getting back to Mr. McMillan's question about the, the playground, um, how does Knox County actually provide any of that for any of our playgrounds, or is that mostly school funded for playgrounds? Ms. Fugit, at this point in time, it is mostly school funded. Um, we're trying to move in the direction of, of uh, some uh, using operation dollars in the future to be able to do that. We're just not there as of yet. I know that's one of, of uh, Mr. Oak's uh, primary concerns right now especially for some of our smaller schools. Well, it is because schools are raising money to either build their playground and then have to mulch their playground. And as we fence them in and as we tell communities, we will keep them open for communities to use them, yet the parents there are funding. I just, just talking about it so that the community understands it is a significant amount of money that our communities and parents are raising to to do our playgrounds because Knox County School capital budget doesn't cover that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on to 23? Okay, item 23 is the design. Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Gloria, I just I thought about something. I was listening yes. and thinking at the same time uh, about what <laughs> Ms. Fugit was talking about and Mr. Dillingham. At, at, and I agree because you have smaller schools that don't have the money. And so I had a concern this week about I have a problem because I don't, I, the kids can't even use the playground because they don't have the proper equipment and they don't have the proper mulch. They can't afford it. And so do you know when we may be able to or what's the plan or how in the future or anything? Ms. Dethridge, at this point in time, I do not have answers. I know that. You know, we are, are continually inspecting our playgrounds now. There are requirements for the depth of the mulch based on the equipment and the right. fall height and so on and so forth. So, uh, as I said, that is part of, of Mr. Oak's agenda, uh, speaking for him since he's not here. Uh, I, I know in conversations I've had with him that if you're going to inspect, you're going to enforce the rules and regulations then there has to be some method that the school system can step in and help out, especially at, at some of these smaller schools that have difficulty raising the money to do that. But at this point, it is still uh, school funds that, that provide right. all of this. Because I know the state requires us to have activities, physical right. activities, but as long as they can't even use the playground. I know Mr. <laughs> French and his people are helping now uh, at least the, the schools can just order the mulch, have it delivered, and then 
Mr. French's guys go out and actually spread it. So that saves some of the cost right there. Okay, thank you. Sorry. And I think maybe this might be a good discussion item for the board in the future, especially as we look at next year's budget. And, and I've heard some creative ideas in the past about combining with Parks and Rec and talking to a commission and the mayor and things like that because so many of our playgrounds are being used during off hours so okay well thank you for those comments and we're going to look at 20, item 23 which is the design for addition and renovations to Inskip elementary are there any questions about that or discussion mr nor no Ms. Hill? mr norman is there somebody here for um Co no. Yes, sir, Mr. Norman. My name is John Templeton, and I'm with Cope Architecture. I'm the project manager on the project. Oh, well, thanks for being here, John. We I had behind the scenes with Jim while you were in the meeting. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, just uh, basically any the we met when we met with Lanny and Brad Salisbury, and we talked about the uh, stormwater demonstration site there in the center, which may be a pond. It may end up being. A, a water garden a yes, water gar a rain garden whatever yes sir. so just the question was uh anything changed since since that discussion no sir uh not at this point we do have in our schematic design a an area that's located between the new buildings roughly where the existing playground is now uh for a bioretention area Okay, and it's, and it's labeled detention pond on the schematic. Yes, sir. It's okay. actually labeled bioretention. Okay. Uh, there, is a re there is a retention pond in the very back uh, near where the um, portables are currently located. Okay. And yeah. we're, gonna, we're looking at putting it somewhere in between there. Now, the key to this is, though, it's completely based on where we are financially. The, the extent of that will, will be dictated with by uh, the funding available. We will do everything because we agree that something should be done and it, it offers a great teaching opportunity as well to uh, utilize that, that area. Okay, very good. I just, you know, just checking in to see if anything. We hadn't dropped checked. it off the radar. Okay. <laughs> Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. What we have on board agenda tonight is the schematic design. Once we get approval on this, we will move into design development, which is where we will start taking an in-depth look into some of the items that Mr. Norman is talking about and to see if we can actually uh, get some of these items included within the funding level that we have on this. So we'll definitely take a look at anything and everything we can on this. And, and that we can fit in the budget to do. Ms. Owen, did you have a question? I, yes. Or um, comment? <laughs> I know you've given me a, sort of a timeline before, but for the rest of the board, could you give us sort of a timeline of how that will take place? It is our anticipation that once we receive schematic design approval Wednesday night, COPE Associates will move forward with design development and then move into construction documents. Our plan is to try to advertise for bids in October, receive bids in November, and bring it back to the board and county commission in December, the construction contract, so that we can get going on construction and start moving, get some bulldozers out there and start moving some dirt. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Dillingham. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Mr. Templeton. Okay, items 24 through 27, discussion or comments, questions? Okay, seeing none, then we'll move into board policies and um, A through P are all second readings. So let's take the first five, A through E since they're on second reading. Are, is there any discussion, questions, or comments about A through E? OK. 
Okay, items F through K. <coughs> and items M through P, and that concludes the second reading. Any questions or discussion? Okay, we'll move into first readings. Uh, the next six are first readings, so let's look at <coughs> Q and R. Just have a question. Thank you. I just have a question about Q, about personnel files. Ms. Doctor, are you a doctor yet, yeah, Dr. Doctor. Drummond? Yes. Um, I just, um, you can probably answer this. So looking at the personal personnel files, it's fairly standard the, the routine stuff that you have to keep in a personnel file. As principals make decisions about non-renews and that kind of stuff, they, they often keep notes. Do those go in personnel files that are then available to the public? I would think if I were a teacher, I would not like that. Uh, how do we handle those sort of things? Any notes that are taken is part of the reason it's documented and the employee will sign that they know that it's going in their actual personnel file that is in HR. If there's any additional notes or things that are taking, that has taken place at the school, that is not in their actual HR personnel file, but it's in their school file. And if the employee wishes to request that, they may request that information as well, but it's not part of their sole human resource file. And are personnel files public record? It is open for open records request. Okay, thank you. I get questions about that. Okay, thank you. Okay, items or policies S and T. I just this afternoon received a, an email, and I think the whole board got it from uh, from one of our constituents with concerns on on several of these. And to be quite honest, I haven't had a chance to really um, study them. Ha, has anyone else on this uh, on the board had a chance to really look look at these? Miss Miss Massey, do you want to? address what we talked about in the policy review. Right. The, so the, today, on Wednesday, you will only be voting on the policy. The discipline guidelines themselves have always been a fluid process so that if we needed to make adjustments throughout the school year based on different needs, um, we are in the process of gathering input from the middle school and high school and elementary principals to, to make any final changes before we put that document out as a, as a final draft. Right. You're talking about procedures, though? Yeah, I'm talking about the discipline guidelines. Were you uh, speaking to the guidelines no, specifically? No, I was actually speaking to the policy, per se. J, uh, SJ191. Um, and again, I apologize. I, this came so, or I looked at it so late today, I didn't have a chance to study it up, but just concerns about. Um, uh, well, it talks about the guidelines being much less severe than the policy. And I guess, um, I don't know, is Lance here? No. Uh, he isn't here this time. Okay. Uh, just being concerned that we've got still a lot of discrepancy between what the policy might say that we're going to approve and then the actual guidelines matching the policy. I know this is a mess, Missy. I know it is yep. with, with getting these all to jail. Well, and the good thing is this is first reading, so, yeah. you know, if we pass. Uh, I, have, I, have no, I have nothing else at this point, but I, I, I would encourage us, which I know we're doing at our policy review meetings, to, to revisit this. Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, I think I might have skipped ahead to the next. That's okay. What are you looking uh, at? I'm looking at the zero tolerance policy. Okay. So maybe... Ms. Massey could speak to this. Um, line 
lines 24 and 25. I just, the way that reads, I don't know. The line that reads, um, it's the next policy down, 7U, where the paragraph that says, it's the board's intent that the director exercise his power to modify to ensure that no student shall be out of school for more than two semesters for a zero tolerance offense. And my concern is about the additional language and that the director of schools uses restorative practices to the extent possible. Um, I don't really know what we're trying to say there or what, what is that? I guess I need some clarification on exactly what that. So, Ms. Vance, go Thank ahead. you, Madam Chair. So the restorative practices is really that ongoing restoration of the relationship so that we've, we've put things, mechanisms in place so that even if a student is on a zero tolerance, that we're still working on repairing relationships. So whenever they return to their base school, um, we have an increased likelihood that the student will be successful in that setting. I don't know if everyone would read it that way. That's my concern because the first time I read this through, and I'm familiar with restorative practice, I read it as, it almost reads like to me that that is an, an option instead of, like if there, is a, if there is this zero tolerance offense that the director has the option to say, we're just gonna use restorative practice to deal with this instead of um, the student being placed in alternative school. I don't know. I just think grammatically the semantics. Okay. That that was not the intent, so we can certainly look at Mr. that. Dupler, I can look at that with Mr. Dupler. Mr. Dupler, do you, did you look at that or can that be changed or worded better? But, but, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, yes, it certainly can be reworded. I mean, um, I know during policy review, that was the first time I'd seen a lot of these changes. And this particular one, uh, most of it is in state law. So, so it has to be in there. And then, of course, the explosive device was added. And that's, yeah. that's, I think that's, I think everybody at policy review agreed that was pretty common sense. But I mean, it, certainly, this certainly this phrasing can be, can be reworded. At, I can tell you that in the past, the way this policy has worked, that, that the director of schools has been able to uh, modify zero tolerance defense, but, but, but again, that's a, uh, that's a case by case special circumstance. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion about the policy listed under U or V? Ms. Owen. Since several people have said that they haven't had a lot of time to look at those changes and they some of them were extensive, maybe we should put this off a moment. Who wants to address I mean, no, that? Uh, right, I'm not, I'm not no, making a motion or anything. It's right. Maybe to think about for Wednesday. I guess which ones Clifford, are you talking um, about? All of the new the, ones? The, the, uh, Clifford had a, Clifford had a clear timeline on what he wanted to see. This on we can let Ms. Massey, we can let Dr. Davis, whoever wants to address this. I do know that they were working real hard to be able to have it ready for the beginning of school. Right. But one of our emails today also stated that it would be better to get it right than to rush it. So do you want to start, Dr. Davis, and then if Missy wants to? No, I'll actually I mean, okay. defer to the board. Um, our goal, our initial goal was to go ahead and try to get them um, through second reading prior to the beginning of school and have principals have the opportunity to be able to put these in their handbooks and start out with all of the rules in place. But, you know, if the board decides otherwise, we will adjust that schedule. Okay. Uh, Ms. Roundtree and then Ms. Deffers. I just had a, this is more of a specific question on J211, the harassment policy. I feel like we're just, we're trying to put restorative practice into that verbiage into all of our policies, which I'm, I'm not against restorative practice by any means, but I just, in this policy on, um, let's see, I think it's the second page, the addition of, um, where it talks about the factors being considered and determining the appropriate response to the students who commit one or more acts of harassment, intimidation, bullying, or cyberbullying, and the addition of that number 
um, eight about the efficacy of the restorative practice with the students involved. Um, we're not we're not going to have restorative practice in place at all of our schools. So I have a concern about that being, you know, we only we only have it at select schools right now. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has concern about that. And then for me, um, I mean, the rest of this is pretty subjective within within itself. But the e efficacy of restorative practice with the student involved, um, I don't know. That doesn't. There's not a lot of meat there, and we don't have restorative practice at every school, so I don't think that's necessary, but maybe maybe Ms. Massey or Dr. Davis wants to respond to that. Ms. Massey. So when, uh, Madam Chair, the DEO recommendations is that we would look at putting restorative practices into our discipline policies, and so the committee has spent the past several months looking at which which of the policies, because there are a lot of discipline policies that they would prioritize and then add those references in and then add them to the other policies as we were able to work through those. And as far as restorative practices, we have, we have training opportunities. We're working really hard to get, I mean, probably I won't say advanced, but we definitely will have initial training at, within all of our schools or most of our schools, all of our administrators had an opportunity to attend a training last week and then we're going to we have summer workshops almost every day this summer yeah. that we have schools signed up for training and i appreciate the the work that you've done and that the committee's done i just it kind of feels just like a little bit like mad libs to me like let's insert insert this phrase within the policy and i don't i mean that is not the intention i think the intention mm -hmm. is to try and change our practice um but given that we don't necessarily have this practice at all of our schools, I'm not sure that we need to change our policy to make to make that statement. I don't know if anybody else, you know. I'm, it's just one thought. Okay, let's go to Miss uh, Owen next. Miss Owen, I, I was just going to say that mostly the same thing, especially regarding number two, where it specifically says that we will implement practices through restorative practices, positive behavior intervention support, and implicit biases. And if we have restorative practices in most of our schools, then there will be some schools that cannot do that. And so we're really setting ourselves up for something that we cannot do. Okay, Ms. Deathbridge. Okay, um, I guess Ms. Massey, my question is, when you brought the, the policies back, the DE, I mean, the committee, steering committee helped put it together, most of these, right? I mean, they were DEO, yeah. So the committee that I'm referring to is we've asked for volunteers from our administrative ranks. We had several teachers, parents, and community members who've been in a year-long process working through the adaptive school model to revise these policies. We had three different committees. One was working on policy. Another committee was working on the discipline guidelines. I apologize. And the last committee um, was working on the Student Bill of Rights. Okay. Somebody so, call and say. So my question, I guess, my question is that then when you have an email such as the one that Mr. McCole, he was on the committee. I, I haven't seen the email, so I can't really I mean, I'm just looking at it from, for the first time myself, and it's rather extensive. So I'm trying to um, understand if they're the ones that brought the recommendation to the board for us to look at. And so we, some of that was by law. We had to not accept all of the changes because you have to go by law. I mean, so we worked with Gary Duper. He looked at it with us. And I know that, um, so I guess I'm kind of, and we, and if we would like to have these policies ready by school so that you don't start school and then make a change. And that's very confusing to the principals and the schools and everybody else. So I know we want to get it right first. This is first reading, so we do have a chance to look at it again and make changes. So I don't know if it's to our benefit to delay it and let school start without understanding that there are some changes that we will be implementing and that we need to have training in order for them to understand what these changes are. But I, um, I'm, a, I'm like you. <laughs> I'm going to read his extensive email and find out what the issues he has, but I thought he was part of the 
committee. So I'm concerned about if he had this much concern about what the committee submitted to us, then I think that would have been a good time to have discussed it then, not after it gets to us and then want us to change what they did. So I don't know if we need to delay it. I think we need to look at it and then come back next month with our suggestions on putting it in policy or putting it in procedures or whatever we need to do. But I don't see delaying it because I think we need to, I think everybody needs to know what, what we're gonna do with discipline. And then we need to start off the school year understanding that. And so um, I guess my concern is more so with getting it right the first time, yes. So we have a month to work on it, a month for maybe Missy and everybody to let's read about what Lance and everybody has to say if we don't want to put a lot of restorative practices. If it's at the first, if it's in the first paragraph, do we have to continue to repeat it? If it's state law, some of the recommendations will ha cannot be done. So we went through this when we sit down at the meeting and we discussed a lot of the issues then. So now we have a month to refine those discussions, but um, I just don't know where Lance was when they discussed this in committee. So I'm just, and maybe it's not as bad as it looks, and it might be something that's simple to, to uh, change and, and make simplify. Right. So I think we just need to look at it, but I don't know if we need to delay it a month, 30 days. I, well, I know in his email, he did say that he was out of town when we had the last policy <laughs> review meeting, and so he was unable to be there, and he apologized for getting it to us so late. Ms. Fugit? Thank you. I was just gonna say, let me, unless somebody wants to write an amendment to change what's before us, I mean, um, which any board member can do if you read um, emails and you want to uh, put an amended uh, policy before us on Wednesday, I, I do think in the spirit of um, simplicity for our staff and uh, out of respect for the work that the committee has done for a year that has been that one of the criticisms is that they do the work and the board never adopts any of it. I would hate for us to not move forward on something. Um, so that, that's, I'm, I, that's all I can offer on this other than I think in the spirit of goodwill, we need to move forward or somebody who has real strong objections to the language that's in here uh, present an amended policy on Wednesday. Ms. Uh, Horn, oh, Mr. Dupler. Well, my question is actually this? for Mr. Okay. Dupler. Going back to what Am to Amber's concern from earlier, if we don't have restorative practices in all of our schools, is the language such that we are opening ourselves up to a problem, perhaps? So that's my concern. Go ahead, Mr. Dupler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Uh, and I wanted to clarify what, what Ms. Ms. Dethridge was talking about as well. We certainly did talk a lot about, about the statutes and about the law uh, at, at the policy review meeting, but as far as restorative practices goes, that concept, that's a policy dis decision to, to be made by this board. It's not, it's not in, in state statute or anything like that. Uh, but Ms. Horn, you are correct in that if, if this board adopts a policy, that policy will be district-wide, and there could be an issue if, if, if restorative practices, uh, if that concept is in the policy but not uh, utilized at every school. So, Miss Hill, did you still want to? It was the same question, Miss Horn. So I would like to ask, so Mr. Duper, what would your recommendation be? Then? Again, I, I mean, restorative practices is something for this for this board to decide. It's a way of of uh, it's a concept that that centers around discipline. It doesn't have to do with 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 the state statutes or the or the federal law uh but i mean i think uh just as miss fugit was saying uh, if a board member wants to suggest an edit to these policies or or if this board wants wants the law director's office to, to try to 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 recraft this policy around restorative practices it, basically to say in schools where that where, where that concept has been implemented, you know, to that effect. I and mean, would that be a, appropriate wording? Sure. Can I, I mean, ask the law director's to office to do that, yeah. please? Thank you. <laughs> you just gave yourself more work. If you if you could if you could make an edit and get it to us by tomorrow morning, so we could look at it. 
before we vote on Wednesday. How about tomorrow afternoon? <laughs> Shall I give you an extension, <laughs> Mr. Doofler? Okay. Uh, Ms. Owen, your mic is down. Did you want to make an additional? I have two things. I think Ms. Fugit just took care of one of them. Um, it was, I may not recall correctly, but I thought that in our policy review meeting, we had decided that we would make language that said to the extent that it could be used. And that's not what happened in two of these policies. So when the policy actually made it to us, we still have the version that we were first looking at instead of the changes that we made in that meeting. So that concerns me quite a bit that, that all of that lengthy discussion and all of those changes that we discussed, we still have pretty much what we started out with. Um, so I, I think we really need to take a look at that and see what, um, what we discussed that maybe is not included here. Um, also, I would rather take more time and get it right and waive second reading than try to clump it all up and, and get a big hot mess out there. So. Okay, regarding the changes that we talked about in policy review, do you want to bring those to, while well, Mr. Dupler's editing everything, did you want him or Ms. Massey to work together to change that? I think, as, I think as long as the language, as long as the language is clear, so that it says that it, so that it makes it clear that it's where it is available, and not that it's required. And an example would be in J193, looking down at, um, let's see what page is this? Second page, number five. It says that if the administrator determines the suspension is long term, the administrator shall develop and implement a plan which includes restorative practices. Obviously, that can't be done. And so that's, that's one of those things that we talked about correcting. So, yes. Thank you. Is there any other more, any further discussion on these first readings? Okay. Well, if not, we'll look at grants, and there are six grants on your agenda, and we'll take A through C first. If there's any questions or discussion on grants A through C. And then grants D through F. And then contracts, we have four. Are there any discussions about, I know Mr. Grubb is here for some of those. Are there any, uh, and Mr. French, are there any questions about A, B, C, or D under contracts? Uh, Mr. McMillan. Um, 9B there, the uh, contracts for student transportation. Uh, I don't think anybody got the the contracts, including the contractors, until Friday, and I've had a couple of calls. That I, I'm not sure that they're they're rather lengthy contracts, and I'm not sure that they totally understand, uh, or they maybe possibly misunderstood uh, some of the stuff. I'd like for Dr. Grubb to talk about it. Okay, Mr. Grubb, Dr. Grubb. Yes, yes, Madam Chair and members of the board. The, um, any specific pieces of it in a mic or a general? Uh, the, the, most of the changes in the contract are either safety related or they're directly associated with the changes in state law that we have to comply with. The um, financial piece is, um, uh, there is a financial piece in here for the contractor. They will, we actually this year, uh, finance department approved $875,000 to the budget for what we are calling our uh, three-year initiative to increase compensation for our contractors, school bus contractors. 
uh, out of that $875, please be reminded, for every dollar in a daily rate, it's $60,000. So two school years ago, Dr. McIntyre and the board, he recommended and the board approved a $600 stipend, $60 for 10 months. This past year, 16-17, we asked for better than a million dollars added to our budget for our initiative, and we received, I'm thinking, one, two, one, th one, three, okay, and that added $2,400 additional to the contract for the 16-17 school year. We asked for as much as we could get this year. We, we received $873,400. And so what that is going to allow us to do is a $200 increase to the school bus contract. At uh, 340 buses, that's $680,000 of, uh, of the 873. We also are projecting the need for up to five buses for overcrowding. We have a problem. We have some problems that we at, uh, at Holston and to the far end of the Gibbs area. We have a, a situation there in your district. We have uh, uh, a number of problems at Carnes and Hardin Valley due to the, to the growth primarily in the Hardin Valley corridor. Uh, those students still are, need to be bused back to the middle school, and we're reaching a point where capacity is, is at its maximum. The other area that we're experiencing uh, uh, overcrowding is in the Toto area. The, uh, the number of students that are utilizing our services to North Shore has exceeded uh, what we anticipated initially. We have a number of families that have chosen to use the bus, a higher percentage than most of our elementary schools, which results in us needing another bus there. Um, the, uh, we, we, I think we have to have three. It gives us some cushion for two where we don't know what might or might not happen. The, um, uh, the only other alternative to adding buses is to have second and third loads. And uh, our principals uh, and our teachers, uh, if we add a second or third load, then they, of course, have to remain on duty to 415, 420 in the afternoon. That's also places students in a situation where they've been in a very controlled environment all day, and that 45 minutes is a time that's it's uh, that's not uh, anything typically planned instructionally, and so it's a it's a difficult management situation, and they're tired, and then they get home, and that means they're 45 minutes later going to their after school activities. But our contractors are, are receiving $2,000 real money, they're receiving a pre and post trip inspection tool to take some paperwork away from them. They are uh, receiving a uh, better radio system and uh, the assistance from us on training their contractors. So they've got a, um, what we feel, what I feel is a, um, is a fair and certainly a better increase than they've typically received in my 19 years. This is a over over a two-year period. We're looking at about a 15% increase. Uh, we're still under market. We're under market, in my estimation, based on our uh, consultants that have that, that have been here and visited and made reports. Uh, similar to what we projected it would be. We're somewhere still uh, somewhat under the market and we'll have to continue this initiative in order for our folks to provide newer equipment and uh, uh, compensate and uh, provide benefits to their employees. Well, the equipment is certainly good and I'm sure everybody will, will benefit uh, from it. And I'm sure they're appreciative of it, but in terms of actual compensation real dollars that they receive now you correct me if i'm wrong but they're paid on a 10-month scale yeah we One, 10 10 payments on their base rate okay. yes sir 
Last year, they were paid for each contract for the large passenger bus, 66 to 70, whatever they, they hold. Um, they were paid uh, $240 per month additional the, month. All buses, not just all buses, all, all 300 this year, all 335 were paid this, those stipends regardless Anybody of the size. Anybody had a contract. No Anybody had a contract. Yes, was. sir. Okay. All right. Now, uh, they also received last year, I think, you said $60 per month from the previous. It was kind of a carryover. From yes, sir. When, because we started in the middle of the year. All right. Next year, how many dollars per month are they going to receive for each individual contract? Each individual contract, all we did is we moved the, four, the, the $600, the $2,400, and the $2,000 for this year, which is a total of $5,000. We divided that by 177 school days and added it to the daily rate. So their daily rate is somewhere around, uh, for instance, a... The 65, 66 passenger bus would be the, we have more of those in the fleet than any other right. size. That's just a typical, looks like a truck on the front bus. And uh, uh, they were being paid at 190.79, and that's going to be moving to 219.03, which if you multiply that out, the difference between those two numbers times 177 days, it's going to be $4,998 and some odd cents. Increase? In, well, from, from what their daily rates were last year, which means they're, they're, they're receiving $200 a month more. Their check for each bus will be $200 a month more than it was last year. So and they get 10 checks, so they're getting $2,000 more. They're going to get. They're getting. Per, per they're getting contract. two. They're getting two thousand dollars per contract at ten installments at two hundred dollars each. Is that, I hope that's clear. So uh, we the we we just moved it all into the daily rate but, instead of having the stipends. I'm not sure that I that I understand uh, that they are getting more more money than they than they received last year. If I am uh, if I am Doug Davis and he Doug sitting here he uh, he is the designated representative uh, who we talk with uh, and he he heads up several committees and uh, Russ and I've met with him uh, multiple times. Uh, if Doug Davis has how many buses do you have Doug? 19, 21. 20, 21 buses. So the bottom line is his check at the month, end of every month is going to be 21 times 200. So he's going to get $4,200 more a month than he got last year. Than he got last year. Okay. And he's got 21 buses. So in, at the end of the year, he's going to get uh, 4200 He's going to get... $420,000 more. <laughs> 42000 I thought I'd get him, get, him, get, him, get him excited with some of my Carter math. Uh, $42,000 $42, more than he got last year, than he received last year. Now, there is some other things embedded in here. One of the things is we have... Uh, in the bus business, it's very the drivers are difficult to find. So what we, when we can, when our terrain and our road infrastructure allows us, we sometimes opt to go to bigger buses. It still takes one driver, but for for every time you can take, uh, put a 90 passenger bus on, if you can put three of those on, you eliminate a 60 passenger bus. But you, but you don't have to have you have to have one less driver, and in fact, it makes Knox County money. The difference between the pay in three of those big buses and one of those sixty passenger buses 
we make money every time we do that. Plus, we haul more children, and we have less drivers. And then the bus contractor, even though they have less vehicles, it's a, it's above, for instance, uh, you're looking at somewhere around forty dollars a day difference in a ninety passenger bus on its daily rate and a sixty five passenger bus, which in a year's time adds up to four thousand and uh, two eighty. That's uh, six hundred eighty seven hundred that at seven hundred thousand dollars. It's seven thousand dollars difference. So it's profitable for everybody. Okay. Wow. So so we so to say I say that to say we have not had a 78 pasture category. The state now allows 78 passenger conventional buses, which is a bus that looks like a truck on the front. And because those are available out there in the resale market, we figured in, I calculated some things in to where we could have that category so we could ask Maybe they can't find a 90 passenger bus, but we can find a 78 passenger bus, and that gives us three more rows of seats on each side in the bus, which in some cases, that's the one subdivision they put in out on uh, Pettigo Road. One subdivision generates that eight or 10 or 12 children. Instead of having to put another bus on, that bus will accommodate the growth. And so, that's, uh, so we've added that. We've also added an increase to the folks that give us midday service. It's very difficult for us to get someone. We have a number of boys and girls that have unique programming. They may go to uh, uh, Goodwill Industries, for instance. They may go out for computer uh, uh, community-based instruction. But it's very difficult to get someone to come and work for two hours or come and work for four hours. So we've we've. Uh, our supply and demand has forced us to raise that a little bit to help those folks so it's uh, easier to get uh, providers because our boys and girls, they need the programs and they're in their IEP, so we're obligated to do that. Is, is there anything in here in, you know, the, the, the money is paid, the, the contract is with the contractor, obviously, and so the money is paid directly to him. Is there anything in these new contracts that uh, either establishes as a requirement or a recommendation about uh, driver pay? I know that I think we, everybody's had a, 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 that's been a big problem for the last yeah. few years of finding uh, enough drivers, enough competent drivers. Well, our, our contract are, are, are with vendors. Uh, our contracts with vendors and we uh, the contract does not specify what their relationship is with their employee it only specifies that they meet the standards that's established federally and, st and by the state and meets the board policy and you know things like uh, interaction with students and uh, proper dress and some of those things but we don't actually get in or have any uh, uh, authority to uh, require a contractor to compensate their employees or provide a certain benefit to them. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gr Ms. Hill, did you have a question for Ms. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Thank you, Rick. That was uh, that's very comprehensive. Clearly, you've done this a long time, and you you know the, the some of the stumbling blocks along the way i think i heard you say then over the last three years the 2400 600 200 is so that's 3200 dollars more per uh per bus 624 2000 five thousand dollars more more all right over the last three years mm -hmm. per bus that that we are paying directly to contractors but then I think I also heard you say to, to Mike that you, you have no idea how much of that passes through to increase driver pay. Is that no, correct? No, ma'am. Uh, it would all be rhetoric or something that a driver might just say to me. Or, right, But right. I don't, I really don't, uh, I don't have conversations with contractors about what they do for their employees. Um, we have been able to help them some with training. Um, and 
in order to encourage our driver pool to come out to training. Uh, last year we were able to um, um, forward some funds to the contractor for them to pass on to their employees. Uh, there is a little bit, there is some money built into this budget to do some of the same things. We just don't, <clears throat> we really, you know, we're, we're, uh, as Mr. Uh, Superintendent Thomas has said, Rick has a spending plan. We don't know what we are going to have to do in August. We don't know who's going to ride the bus. We don't know what day they're going to ride the bus. And so we try to get a, we try to get a plan based on our historical information and what we project student populations to be. And, um, and then when, it's about December when we see how we stand. And then, then if we, then, then we implement, we have some training in the fall, but we, the remain, we, we would like to provide four hours of training to every driver every year. Right. Now, did I <coughs> also hear you say, Rick, that even with this almost $5,000 increase per bus over the last three years, that we still are paying below the national average or well, what the industry the, standard is? Yes, ma'am. The consultants that did, we had school bus consultants that were here uh, last year, early in the year, and performed a very comprehensive I remember that. Uh, uh, look at what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, at that point, uh, I believe his final statement was that you're on a rubber band situation. Right, I remember and, that. And uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we are probably, we're probably somewhere, uh, still $7,500 below what would be a market for a school district our size. So $7,500 per bus. 330 and, uh, buses. 340 buses. Yeah. A significant amount of money. Yeah. So, you know, we're so thankful that we have a contractor family here that, that supports our school district. And many of these, many of our contractors have done this for multiple generations. Yeah. You know, we have people who have been driving 50 years, and uh, it's, a, um, it, it's, a, it's a passion for most of our folks, and uh, they love the kids, and uh, many of them transported the grandparents and the parents, and now they're transporting their children. And it's because of those relationships that we're able to stay in, in where we are. And uh, so I'm thankful that the, that the board has found uh, the money to help them, and uh, uh, look forward to uh, hopefully that happening again in, in subsequent years. So Rick, this uh, a, new, a new contractor, I, I forget their name, that came in this last year that had a bunch of new buses. I Echo think they were out of state. It's Echo Ride. Okay. Um, if we are $7,500 a bus below the standard, how, why'd they come? Well, uh, they hope it's going to get better is what they tell me. Okay. And, you know, we did a, to, for, for your quick information, we did a nationwide solicitation for, for vendors. Uh, we spent several thousand dollars on trying to get people to come in and, uh, and make offers. We, they were the only, they're the only person in a regular bus business that's made any kind of a uh, return call or request for information. We do have one vendor that provides some of our shuttle services that's an out-of-state vendor. But other than that, they're all local people. And uh, right now, we have no applicants. So I'm very appreciative of our local drivers, our local contractors, big time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming that you said that we're, you've increased the daily rate per driver rather than doing a stipend. Per, per contract. Per contract. Per contract. Per bus contract. Yes. Per, we call it service assignment. So, so Bill Meads 31 is a service assignment. Okay. Yeah. And so when you did a stipend, it was the same way. It was yes. per contract. And the same, the same logic applied, that the, the contractor then does whatever they choose to do with the stipend? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and a lot of it, I will, I will tell you, our equipment, we've, we've, we've had a lot of our folks invest in a little better equipment. 
You know, we've, we've got a lot of new buses that we didn't have. And, uh, you know, we can't, I don't think that we can expect all new buses at this rate, but our equipment is getting the newer, which leads to less breakdowns and uh, they look better and they, they feel safer. And, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Grubb. Um, okay, it is 6.23 and we are going to take a short break and resume at 6.30. So before we start into our regular agenda items, there are four of those. So.
thank you. Like that thing. Okay. Uh, I made her do it. I made her do it. Okay. So we're going to start back with the regular agenda items and. Item A is to approve the Knox County Board of Education annual calendar for 2017 and 18. And board members, there are two changes on the hard copy that you have before you. And one of those was to do away like we did this year, but just on the front end with the May mid-month because of graduations. And the other is to look at, um, that was a tentative placeholder that Ms. Terry Miss Terry, Miss Coatney had put in there for the annual board workshop retreat uh, because it was an open date with UT football. But being that there are no new board members, swearing in ceremonies, orientation, uh, we would like to look at doing that earlier in the school year before we get too far in on the 11th as a one day workshop rather than involving two days. So. Anyway, are there any questions or discussion on the board annual calendar? No. Um, Miss Deckridge? I just want to be here on the October 2nd, but it's nothing to do with you guys. It's the state board meeting that we, that day. Oh, okay. That's not right. That's not it's not on okay. Wednesday. It's not. It is. October 2nd is work session. You're good. Wednesday. Oh, boy. Well, okay. Are, is there any other discussion? Okay. Well, let's move to item B. And that is to approve the differentiated pay plan for Knox County Schools for 2017 and 2018. Discussion or questions on that? Okay, and C is to approve Knox County Schools Middle School Zoning Plan um, associated with New Gibbs and Hardin Valley Middle Schools. Questions, discussion? Ms. Fugit. The only thing I, I will say, because we took that time, and I, I think the, um, once again, we need to commend um, the staff and everyone who worked so hard. I think the process that we did years ago when we did North Shore by having the community meetings whenever we're doing a rezoning and getting lots of feedback, I think that has helped this process um, go much more smoothly. So I commend all the staff that spent a lot of time working, listening, the school board members whose districts this directly affects. I know that you spend a lot of time and energy on that, and I think this is a, a, a nice way when it works this smoothly. So I just wanted to commend people for that. Thank you, I would agree. Okay, item D, we didn't have to take a break after all. Discussion <laughs> and possible action to surplus property located at Sammy Hill Family Community Center. Ms. Fugit. Thank you. Um, uh, I talked to Mr. Dupler about this beforehand, but I just wanted us to talk about it on, on the record because often when we have an opportunity to surplus properties, it sometimes gets confusing for board members and community because we purchase, it's titled in, to Knox County, not the Board of Education, um, but if we're going to surplus, then it, we have to approve it and then... Um, any sale or whatever, it, the, it goes back to the county general fund, but Mr. Duplin and I talked about it, and he had a great explanation of how that works. Could you just share that for folks? Because we do have new board members that may have not been through this before. Uh, be happy to. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Fugit. Um, and, and I think what we also talked about was, uh, you know, our office can do a memorandum, and I can look back historically to see if if we have one available, but if we don't, we can we can certainly do one. But you know, Knox County and and Knox County Schools, uh, you, you know, work together on these on these parcels of property. And when when the county purchases a a, a, a parcel for the schools, um, it, I mean, it's not exactly the same. But I mean, a good analogy is what we talked about would be uh, like a life estate for the schools. So as long as the schools 
uh, you know, wants to use a piece of property for obviously a campus, for a school, or 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 some other purpose that's that's dedicated to school use, then then the school system and the board has that opportunity to use that for as long as, as long as necessary, as long as needed. And as long as we're willing to pay for it. Well, yeah. <laughs> as long as you're willing to operate it, I think I think I think that's key. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so. Uh, so in this case, I mean, this is a piece of property, yes, that is, that is uh, deeded to Knox County. Um, and frankly, this, this request did not come from our office. I mean, but if, but if this board so, so chooses and so votes, I mean, we can, we can prepare a resolution to surplus this, this parcel of property. Uh, but obviously, if it is surplus, this board is saying that, that, that you are no longer going to use this property for, for Knox County Schools purposes. And then, and then the county will then take it over. And I, and I think what's happening here, and again, this is not just our office involved, but I think what's happening in this particular case is that there needs to be an agreement between the city and the county uh, to, use this, to use this property in a, in, a, in a different way, such as a, a recreation center or, you know, I don't have all those details, but I mean, that's, that's what, that's what is, is the goal of this particular parcel. And so that's sort of my question is, so at this point, if we say we agree to this in principle, is that all we're really looking for? Because we have no document to actually approve. Um, would we have to, I'm asking, as, as our attorney, do we have to have a legal document transferring it that we approve? Do we have to, I would assume we have to actually surplus it since we have to surplus other property that then gets deeded to someone else or used for something else. That's kind of my, my questions. Procedurally, how would we do this? As the board's attorney, uh, I, would, I would recommend the board have additional information before you uh, have a final decision on surplusing this property. Um, you know, what you have before you, I think, is enough to cause a discussion. And certainly there's been uh, publicity about this particular uh, uh, you know, project, uh, but I mean, that's my recommendation. So I guess what I would say is I'm not objecting to this in principle. I, I just want us to have to do it legally and correctly and know exactly what it is we're taking action on. So I guess that's what I, if the board would like, I would ask for you as our attorney to dig a little deeper and bring us something. I mean, we can have discussion. Maybe if nobody thinks this is a good idea, we don't need to go that far, but I, I'm not opposed to doing this. I'd just like to know how we procedurally do it. We can, we can ask the question again. Uh, when this came up on the agenda, it did not come from our office. I can, yeah, yeah, yeah I can tell you that. But we can ask a question. You know, uh, who is this coming from? Is this the city? Is this uh, some, someone at the city county building? You know, with the county? I mean, yes, we can ask those questions. Because we would not have anything to vote on. Yes. Did you have? David, can you tell us? The city. David, okay. Do you have the response to this question? I've got. I've got a, I guess I'll team up. My name is David Brace. I'm the senior director for public works for the city. And I hear uh, for the city tonight, I think you're exactly right. Um, as this project has evolved, there's actually Kevin DuBose and Hannah Parker also here with the Inward Youth Foundation. And uh, there has been some media exposure. Uh, had a great public meeting the other night out at Lonsdale Elementary. I think we had always anticipated, the city had always anticipated, like any redevelopment area, and this parcel is within a redevelopment area, the Lonsdale redevelopment area, which was done in 2005. And so we've always anticipated that there would be uh, really a couple of legal documents. One would be a legal document between the city and the county and or the, the county schools. And, and however that's structured, I would defer to, to counsel on that. Um, and, and really what we're hoping, and then there will be a legal document between the city, which city council would approve, um, outline expectations for the site. Um, so let me give a little background on that. I think many of you have heard about it, but uh, several months ago, uh, Emerald Youth approached Mayor Rojero about uh, uh, their board members and their organization being interested in investing about seven, eight million dollars on a youth serving facility in Lonsdale. Um, at the same time, there was significant demand and we've heard that demand for many 
many years within Lonsdale, really since the 05 redevelopment project, but even before that there were needs for uh, lighting and improved infrastructure on Texas Avenue, youth serving uh, facilities, especially for middle and high school aged uh, youth, uh, especially boys of color, uh, and also uh, that in the community there was uh, desire for uh, uh, removal of a nuisance uh, uh, convenience mark. And so about the time that, uh, that Emerald came to the city, there had been a public meeting uh, at, at Reverend uh, Pastor Joe Smith's church where those came to the head again. And so it was a great opportunity and Mayor O'Hara was interested in it. And uh, we started to do legwork. Emerald started to do legwork in the community. The mayor had a public meeting last Thursday. We approached uh, uh, previous superintendent, Mr. Thomas, and about the same time, uh, Mr. Bob Thomas was coming into his role, so we then briefed uh, Bob at the same time, uh, Superintendent Thomas. Uh, so again, I think what we would hope uh, is that there would be a, a vote on surplusing the property contingent upon an agreement, and I don't know how we would do that, Mr. Duper, um, but contingent upon, uh, I think, and just so it's on the record, what we envision is if the property was sold, it would be any proceeds would go back to the school board or the county uh, commission that the use of the property for a certain period of time, and I'll give an example, say 15 years, would be for certain youth serving uh, facilities. Uh, and so those are the type of things that we would see in that agreement. So I, I guess what we had provided, the city had provided, uh, Mr. Dillingham and others was a legal description, a parcel map. Um, and so however we need to get that information to the school board, I think that's really what I'm here tonight to try to help work through that that process so we're all comfortable um, what I would say again I am absolutely fine with the concept but I'm not going to vote to surplus property okay. without seeing some sort of agreement that that is a little more binding than subject to I just we've never done that okay. before I think it's um, probably not a good practice for us to vote to surplus what I can tell you is because I don't have anything to vote on um, other than saying I'm for it move forward if you've got something y'all can whip up a document by Wednesday I'm happy to take a okay. look at it is there is there um, a sense of urgency that that it can't wait till July um, there, there's yes. a, there is a <laughs> bit of back there going yes yeah I mean I, and, and I'll let Emerald if they'd like to come up and talk about it. I think there is a sense of urgency that there's a significant amount of work that the, that the city needs to do before any agreement with Emerald Youth can proceed forward to City Council. Uh, there, are, there are a number of parcels, so we have to do a one-lot subdivision. We have to close right-of-way. So there's a number of civil engineering tasks that need to happen, and we really don't want to start that public process until uh, this body has vetted and feels comfortable with that. I don't want to have signs go up from MPC in the neighborhood, and this body has not yet uh, the, the, the elected officials have not yet weighed in. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I do think, though, typically what we do is we surplus and then it has to go to commission. It does. So, you know, um, so I, I would hope that we could have something in some sort of written form that I can feel comfortable voting on on Wednesday. I'm not opposed okay. to doing that, but Mr. And Duper, do you think that's possible? I'd be happy to talk to Mr. Brace after after the meeting, and uh, you know I think it would it would involve uh, more than likely the uh, the city's law department as well. So yeah, and, and perhaps it, it's at least yeah. going to have to be an MOU or something that yeah. that delineates what we're doing rather than we're just surplusing this problem property. That's. Okay. When I think we're, you know, I, I'm very familiar with the, yeah. uh, the city council process. I think I'll definitely defer to Mr. Duper and Mr. Dillingham and others and Mr. Thomas, Superintendent Thomas, about the process that this board needs to be comfortable. Um, again, we want the vetting. I think the city wants to make sure we had a, uh, Ms. Dethridge was at a public meeting. We had about 75, maybe a few more folks at that public meeting. Emeralds met with over 300 individuals. We want this to be a vetted uh, Lonsdale based community project and we want the board to feel comfortable so and please um, understand I'm not opposed to the you. project I'm trying to make sure that as I'm doing my fiduciary responsibility as a board of education member yes. that the I's are dotted and T's are crossed 
for us. Absolutely. Thank so you. we, you've got till tomorrow to get one project and Wednesday to get the other. We'll make that happen, hopefully, and um, get with Mr. Swanson, and we'll talk after this meeting. You're going to be a busy man. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No. Did you have a question, Ms. Roundtree? I guess I'll defer to Mr. Dupler on this. So is this, what I'm hearing is, is the board does have to sign off on this. To release the property. To release the property. So county commission is not solely able to do that. I guess it's just, it's a little, it's a little murky for this me. This is that whole property thing. That the whole, I know, we've been through the whole property thing before, but this. It's even murkier. Okay, yeah. Mr. Dupler. Just again, I mean, when, when you've got a piece of property that the Board of Education either owns or operates, I mean, there's still property that is, that is in, that is titled to the Board of Education. So, I mean, obviously the board owns that property. But, but in this case, the county owns it and the board operates the property. So the board, uh, you know, has to give, yeah, the first say so to be able to say, hey, we're not going to use this property anymore for any type of, of, of district school pr purposes. So. And then it's just going to county commission. Right. Right. Yes. And, then, and then, then you're basically handing handing the baton if you will to county commission and then county commission in this particular case would need to work with the city uh city council to try to fashion some type of i i would imagine an mou uh, to be able to use the property miss horn yeah i i just i think it, i would feel better about it i i love the project i think it's great um exciting for the lawn sale community i just want to be sure that that um parcel is used for the intended purpose so I would I would um, agree I would like to see an MOU regarding that and Miss Bowen did you have a comment I'm gonna suggest that all board members go back and take a look at this from a satellite perspective and compare it to what we have in our documents so that we can really look at what is currently there um, because I'd like to know what's happening to this playground equipment that's there right now, because that's right in it. Um, it looks like there's some picnic area that would be gone. There, there's some a parking area. Oh, that's gone. Would you? So, that's. But I had talked to Mr. Diggs about where possible recycling that. Uh, the things that are there, if we can save them and recycle them in some way, so I don't know. Right. When it, when it was first presented to me, it was a kind of a little strip, but this is a quite a bit larger than what I was first looking at, and I know that's been several months. But I'm I'm just suggesting that we all go back and look at that satellite picture so we can really get a clear, because when we look at the drawing, those things aren't there. I think we need to compare that drawing to the satellite just so we are very aware of what's there. Mr. Stanford. I'm sorry, Mr. Bryce, did you want to oh, thank go you, ahead and then oh. Mr. Bryce can. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I was at the meeting, you're right. That's and right. and that was the point I brought up when it first came up, that is a public park. And so I want to make sure the community was comfortable with that because that's where they do their annual uh, homecoming. So it's been a lot of discussion, yes, and you kind of, like you said, you've talked to 300, because I was not going to support anything that the community was not wanting to, to support and had a problem with. But you're right, they're going to get rid of all the things that's there now. But my question is, who maintains that property now? Does the city or the county? What? You do? Yeah. The school system. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Dillingham. Mr. Dillingham personally goes out there and mows it every week. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. I just know it's always clean and nice, and I just yeah. want to know. So we are the ones taking care of the property right now. So it belongs to us. We maintain it, even though it does have all the equip all the things on it. And I'm like you. I like for us to do something with it. But if the community feels like they have, would rather release those type of things in order to have something that's better for the community, I'm all for that. My question has always been about accessibility to the community once you have that. And uh, Mr. Dubos, they, we've already, everybody's had this type of discussion and they've already discussed accessibility and about getting the community involved. So as long as the community's fine with it, I'm fine with it. Okay. 
So, uh, but I am like you, we need some kind of document to make it official so we can officially release it since we do take care of it. And so. And you had a nice question. compliment, Mr. Dillingham, how well it's been kept. <laughs> well, and for full disclosure, that's Jim French and his people that <laughs> maintain it. So I was just family. saying we do. So. And, and I would also like to point out that you do have a copy of a legal description. Uh, in the packet, and that is typically what is used when we are surplusing property back. So there's there's typically not an, a memorandum of understanding or anything like that when we're sur surplusing property back to the county. Uh, a lot of times in a situation like this, we will have the documentation from a surveyor to do the one lot subdivision that will be required to separate this property out from the whole. But the legal description actually does that as well. So it, uh, I, I'll meet with Mr. Dupler and Mr. Brace afterwards as well, but in, in my opinion, there's enough information there to, to do the surplus. But typically it's at least worded in the form of a motion that says what we're actually doing, which would be helpful. And my, the only other question I have, I think the reason we're talking about it more is because some of the community concerns about it's fine to surplus to the county if they're selling a vacant lot that nobody uses, that's kind of not quite the issue. But when it's been used for community, I think that's why we're having a little more concern. Mr. Price, did you well, have anything? Well, I think I just, uh, we have, the, obviously the homecoming has occurred on that parcel for a number of years. I know that Emerald and the city are fully committed to make sure that, making sure the homecoming has space, and, and if not better space, to continue that, uh, what really is becoming a signature event, not just in Lonsdale, but in the community. Um, you know, it's interesting, the facilities, uh, Ms. Owen, that were installed on that property, so the property is county owned and oftentimes Mr. French and I have conversations every year because our mowing contractors don't know who mows it because it is like a city park. Uh, I believe Mr. Anderson, my mentor, former boss, uh, Sam Anderson, had the gazebo and some of the play equipment installed there. Uh, through the city parks and rec department because it was a vacant piece of property that could be utilized by the kids of Lonsdale. Um, we have installed the city Gerdau steel uh, and um, uh, working with uh, uh, Ms. Dobson, we've installed a, a playground in Lonsdale homes uh, that Gerdau helped to fund and KCDC. So that's really a, a, a small playground for younger kids. Uh, this facility would be a full, two full gyms uh, would have a learning center for older middle school uh, youth, uh, would have an art room, have concessions, two multi-purpose, full multi-purpose fields, lacrosse, soccer, flag football. So uh, we, we obviously want to make sure the community is supportive and uh, we're going to continue to make sure they're supportive and, uh, and we want people happy and I know that Emerald does as well. But we want to make sure that the legal agreement between the city and the county is buttoned up and I have no problem with starting that dialogue now and making sure that the board is comfortable. And then really that big agreement is between Emerald and or the entity that's gonna run this operation in the city to make sure it stays youth serving for a certain number of years. Okay. Mr. Norman. Thanks, David. Uh, the, the fields, are those, I mean, this isn't all indoor, is it? Nope, uh, so there I will mean, be two full multi-purpose fields okay. uh, everybody says soccer fields it'll be everything from flag football to soccer to lacrosse to flag football to very similar to what you see down at the samson sports complex along dale avenue and so two full fields lit brand new infrastructure around it sidewalks on texas lighting and on-street parking on texas um, then you're going to have Really, that's on the city parcel. So the city owns an entire block that was bought for blight abatement because there were a number of blighted and uh, uh, poorly dilapidated, uh, poorly maintained and dilapidated homes. We own that entire block. We actually were going to do a commercial project there. We did a request for a proposal. Didn't get a single market proposal on that. So we held it for a while. Then this opportunity came up. The, the gym facility would actually be on the county parcel. So that section that shows some of that parking, that's a little gravel lot there. So the proposal, and it's conceptual at this time, Emerald hasn't want to, they don't want to spend a lot of money on construction documents until they feel comfortable this is moving forward. 
would be improved parking, full gym, and again, what Emerald is committed to is that gym could be utilized by Sammy Hill during the school hours, on the, so it's on a single piece of property, no road between it, so the kids could go into the gym. So there is some real benefit, I believe, for Sammy Hill. Um, and then so, that, so the surplus property, I'm looking at one that says new multi-purpose building. Yes. Is that on the surplus property? That's on your surplus property, yes. Okay. When I say yours, the county, there we go, there's my map, yep. Um, that is on the county facility. The multi-purpose field one and two, and where it says parking spaces right in the middle, yeah. that's currently Minnesota. The city would have to close right away to do parking that would serve both complexes yeah. and the school system. Yeah. Uh, there would be parking up the middle. And then again, uh, the county property is in a multi-purpose building. Gotcha. And that's the gym, learning center, kind of a college style learning center with a coffee shop style feel for middle and high school kids, which is where a lot of the demand is. Obviously, Lonsdale Elementary is a community school. They serve the younger folks in Lonsdale. So um, that's a big piece. I mean, that's a really big piece for this project. Again, uh, it's, it's around eight to nine million. The city's infrastructure is around a million and then the appraised value. I know there's been questions about separation of church and state. We obviously have our council. We're going to make sure that we meet separation of church and state. So Emerald may have to buy the property versus a direct transfer. And again, that's where the any proceeds that would come in for this property need to go back to the county. Um, we also have talked about uh, to the, if you're looking at the existing building, uh, Sammy Hill, to the right is where that playground is. We've talked about putting some resources into that existing playground, bringing that up to a higher standard, and again in the evenings opening that up to the community so you'd have a playground parents could walk the loop kids could be playing soccer basketball gym learning center so again uh, we hope it's a model that i'm not familiar with other uh, urban spaces where you have a 10 million dollar complex right in the middle of a community like this so again as long as the neighborhood feels comfortable we'd love to continue forward and whatever we can do to, to make sure this board is comfortable we'll hopefully get there with uh, with mr duper Gloria, do you have one last comment you want to yeah, make? Yeah, I thought was that. He had, he had touched on it. So the, the playground that's attached to Sammy E. Hill yes, will have some work done on it. I mean, I think that was part of what the principal was excited about yeah. was that the playground was going to be have a facelift. Yeah, so. what, what we've, I mean, again, <clears throat> we're in the concept phase, and the desire now is to have a, a gym, uh, to have that gym used by Sammy Hill improved playground because I know uh, the school system struggles with resources for playgrounds. We just, I heard discussion about mulch and as the guy that manages Parks and Rec, I understand mulch <laughs> and so uh, in rock. So an improved playground, because again, if you go down to the Samson Sports Complex or really any sports complex, what do parents and young kids or siblings do where their older siblings are playing soccer, they're walking, they're playing on the playground, mm -hmm. they're running around, they're having a great time. So could that become a real, really a neighborhood hub for Lonsdale? I mean, as you know, Lonsdale is in many ways one of the most diverse communities we have in Knoxville, Latino, Hispanic, African American, um, and, and really a traditional Caucasian area, and they're kind of separated. So does this become a, a way for us to bridge those communities? And uh, we're excited. We feel like this project is a kind of a vision to make that happen. And the community school, how do we link in the community school, the existing city rec center? And then you've got a great park that the city spent half a million dollars on in 2012. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other mics down on this last, I think that was the last item, wasn't it? Okay, so next would be public forum. Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have one speaker signed up for public forum this evening. Todd Shelton. And if you would just remember, state your name and your county. Uh, Todd Shelton. Uh, Knox County. Um, I want to get us back to thinking about um, uh, discipline policy away from the land value. Um, essentially, uh, I want to agree with Mr. McCall's letter that he sent all the board members. Um, I'm also a member of Stop School Push Out. Um, we feel that, you know, many of our current rules in the school system need improvement the way they're expressed and defined and how the punishment is, is meted out. 
Um, it hurts everybody in the system, and in our case, especially uh, African-American students and students with disabilities, um, as well as other marginalized populations of the school system. So it's a problem that we've, uh, that the school system's had for some time, and, but it's evolved, and now y'all have approved the uh, task force findings, and we're dealing with this. And so starting to look at uh, discipline procedures and rules. I was another person that was from the community on some of these committee on one committee since October, I think. Um, and I want to commend the board for today, just really thinking hard about what you did here. Um, I think that this process is a um, it's, it's it's a long-term process. We've we've had this problem for some time. Uh, going back 20 years, and and people have tried to fix it, and and it, and it hadn't gotten fixed. So um, we're looking at 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 using the community, and Melissa Massey has pulled some of us in, and I'm hoping that that's going to even get larger because in the in the sessions I sat in, we were with schoolroom teachers, we're in uh, vice principals, principals, and we had community people. And we had difference of opinions amongst everybody, uh, but people were in a position to really think about policy. And we learned that to listen, and we learned to compromise, and I think some good work was done. Um, it's gonna be sometimes a slow go, just like the cultural competency contract didn't make it this time. And instead of us being concerned about that being late, we're concerned about getting it right. And it's the same thing on these rules. Some of these rules will have some flaws in them because some of the restorative practices, PBIS and cultural competency training won't be up to par. So some of those things, um, uh, you know, we can't offer some of the solutions that we'd like to in behavior situations. So I think there's a way to deal with that, though, and, and to move and let these policies progress along. And so we're asking you guys to stay with us on this thing. This is y'all voted this in, and we're, we're, uh, we think it's really important. Um, everybody here, I think out in the schools, is starting to really focus on the issues that we're trying to deal with. Um, it, and it certainly stresses the need for the combined influence of the cultural competency, the uh, restorative practices, and the PBIS to all work together. And that's where we're going. So um, I just, uh, I don't quite understand the second reading and et cetera, but we'll be keeping up with that and getting some advice from you folks. But um, um, let's be patient with this. And if the rule, if our, some of our policies have to evolve while some of the services that we want to offer, then, then we, shouldn't, we should feel okay with that. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes public forum, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Then the next will be board forum. Mr. McMillan, do you have anything? Ms. Hill? No. no? Ms. Horn? I have one thing. We have one of our Farragut Middle School students is up for the uh, Boomer Athlete of the Year Award. And I haven't, I just remembered, I haven't voted today, but um, you have to vote. So make sure if you don't know, go to, uh, just go on to Facebook and search Avery Flatford um, Boomer and it'll come up. I'm sure there's a, there's a link and you can vote every day and voting, I think tomorrow's the last day. It is. Yeah, and she was down probably 2,500 votes yesterday. So tell your friends, everybody vote. And you can you can vote multiple times a day too, I think. Okay. I think it's every couple hours it'll reset. Okay, vote. Vote, so. vote, vote, vote. Tell everybody you know. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to quickly share that, um, although it's way in advance, I did do a proposal for NSBA to go and present there to share about the great work of our community schools. So we'll find out sometime in September if 
the proposal got accepted, so keep your fingers crossed. And I just wanted to remind folks, um, if you still have questions or comments, we had a public meeting at South Dole Middle School. Oh, that's my time. <laughs> Stop talking, Amber. Uh, at South Doyle Middle School regarding the potential BMX track there, and there's a link on the Knox County Parks page to give your feedback. So I just wanted to give folks a reminder about that. Thank you. Miss Huget. Thank you. Um, now that Ms. Roundtree said that about community schools, I, I do think we're doing great work, and I hope we get accepted. Are we going to... Um, Mr. Thomas, are we going to be able to have some data tied to our community schools to look at? What, are, are we going to have a mid-month pretty soon to talk about what kind of progress we're making with um, over the over the years that we've had community schools in terms of disparities and that kind of stuff? Or can we? Because I do think it's a program that we talk about how great it is, but it needs more funding. And if we can show results and talk about that, I think that would be good. I can say that I think with the Great Schools Partnership Board that they have somebody that's come on staff now that is doing just that, and it would help Miss. Should we get accepted with Miss Roundtree's proposal, it would be good to have that information. I know years ago when Pond Gap was the first right. school, we had it, and that's what made us do some more. Yes. So, so okay, Mr. Norman. Thank you. Uh, I spoke to uh, five faculties on the teacher's last day this year, and which is a little bit of a, I don't know, that's probably not a smart thing to do sometimes. I, <laughs> I remember one uh, faculty meeting in particular that I was in and a school board member came. They left before the meeting was over. They were basically run out of the meeting. Um, but anyway, uh, I talked about some of the stuff that we we did and what we're trying to do and and I thought those fac faculties were certainly very kind and receptive and uh, they were most favorably receptive about the probably the biggest thing that we did which is choose Mr. Thomas so I just wanted to share that well, thank you. okay Miss Owen um, I just wanted to mention that we have several um, safety patrols that are in DC this week uh, they have posted lots of interesting pictures on Facebook and Twitter, and it looks like they are, are doing a lot of learning out there. I've seen some pictures from um, Shenandale and Bill Morris in my district. I've also seen some from Mount Olive, and um, the reason Mount Olive comes to mind, uh, one of my music teacher friends had a student who is now working in D.C. She went on that safety patrol trip when she was young, and she got to speak with those safety patrol students, so that was very special for them. So um, keep your eye out for all those interesting things going on with our safety patrols this week. They're home. Are they home, all of them? No okay. <laughs> okay. Next year we ought to go meet on the buses if we don't have a meeting. Okay, Ms. Dethridge. Uh, yes. Uh, first, I want to make a, ask, ask a, a question. Amber brought up the BMX thing. Is that something that we have to vote on as a board since it's a uh, uh, middle school? Well, that's football? another. That, I guess that kind of goes back I'm to just asking, I don't really. I keep thinking they're doing all this schematics and things. Yeah, I don't, I haven't gotten any specifics of how we would, we would vote on it. I mean, I, my understanding from the public meeting was that county commission will have to vote. I, maybe I should defer to Mr. Dupler before I stick my foot in my mouth. It seems similar to the it's situation not on the agenda. we were just I don't talking know, about. So. I don't know. I suggest, I, mean, I, I suggest you look into it for us. <laughs> yes, yes. Can we That's please? the third item for you to do. Yeah, and we don't have to do that before Wednesday, but I think... That can be next week. It has already... Um, it was already approved in county commission's budget. And so I guess it actually, there's still two sites, Ms. Dethridge. There's, um, they're, they were look, holding a public meeting to talk about the potential of the South Dole Middle site. And then there's also the possibility to use... Uh, the property at Safety City. So it really depends on which property they use for the project. The only reason I ask because we put some, we just upgraded it. Yeah. yeah. Because of self, you know, the community was upset yeah. about us not having it. Okay. That was, a, that was the business part. The other part is that I want to um, share that Austin East will be, ha students from Austin East will be doing uh, their little radio spot, uh, spot um, 
99.7 uh, every Wednesday from 1 to 2. It's their new audio production group, and so they're going to, uh, Joe Armstrong and his radio station decided to let them go ahead and try it during the summer every Wednesday. So if you have 99.7, if you want to listen in on Wednesday from 1 to 2. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Raul. Um, I just want to say that this past year has been an incredible learning experience for me, and it's been an honor to represent the students of Knox County, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the new student rep will do. Thank you. Thank you. And you will be officially recognized on Wednesday night, and um, I'm going to go ahead and do board forum, and then I think Ms. Roundtree just has... Um, some closing remarks, but um, the CMA Music Teachers of Excellence Dinner and Awards um, hosted by Little Big Town were held on Wednesday, April 26th in Nashville at the Nissan Stadium. And one of Knoxville's finest music educators for 40 years, Becky Thomas, was honored among those uh, honorees. She also happens to be the wife of our superintendent, um, who did not know I was going to do this tonight, by the way, so he had no idea. But CMA brought a large production crew from Nashville who spent the whole day at Central High School and around the city shooting the video of Ms. Thomas and her former student, Kelsia Ballerini. And Kelsia, Kelsia, however she pronounces it, who had, has had three number one hits simultaneously on the country stations. The video they made is entitled Making Dreams Come True. This video, as well as Brad Paisley's and Darius Rucker's videos talking about their music teachers and the importance of music education will be played on the big screen this month during the CMA Music Festival, June 8th to 11th in Nashville. And the Country Music Association and Sony have invited Ms. Thomas to be their guest for the four-day event. So you will want to tune in um, or not miss July's board meeting and the showing of the video, Making Dreams Come True next month, that features music education, Central High School, Knox County Schools, Ms. Thomas, and Kelsey Ballerina. Wow. So. Oh, cool. Is she going to take my <laughs> <laughs> no. think, I think she's taking a friend. Okay, Ms. Roundtree, and then we'll uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as Ms. Bowne said, we're going to officially honor uh, our student rep, Sydney, on Wednesday night for uh, official picture taking, but we had a little celebration for her this evening, so I just wanted to thank her for her work um, on the board as student rep uh, this year. And then also wanted to thank uh, our partnership with KCA President Lauren Hobson. This is uh, her last meeting as well, well, Wednesday, as the KCA President, so I know she has put in lots of hours and been a familiar face here, and I'm sure she's uh, eager to return to Halls Elementary in her teaching position. So just thank you to her for that partnership. And that's all. Move to adjourn. Wait, wait, one thing. Oh, one more. Oh, Ms. Gaffer, <laughs> I forgot, you know. and I forgot to say that you did have a Bearden High School graduate to win the voice. Yes, we Chris did. Chris Blue, so congratulations, Knoxville. Yeah. I did not know he went to Bearden yeah, High School. Yeah, he went to Bearden High School. School. Congratulations, Knoxville, Knox, Bearden, Knox Bearden, County Bearden, High. Yeah. 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 Yeah, now moving. <laughs> and he is pushing the 3,000 votes that she needs, Avery needs. So anyway, they're in partnership. Okay, she's moved to adjourn. Do I have a second? Yes. Okay, meeting's adjourned.